Well, good afternoon. Good to see you. Good to see some familiar faces, and uh, also very good to see some uh, maybe for the first time. In fact, just uh, to help us out, my curiosity a little bit, how many of you are here uh, for the first time one of these lectures? Can I just see a show of Ah, great. Okay. Well, on behalf of the Melbourne Historical Society, uh, we welcome you and hope you'll come back for more. I guess this is our third annual uh, lecture series, if we count the bicentennial, it started two years ago, and we like to think we're uh, uh, learning along the way and providing a, a kind of a unique public service with this lecture series. We know that there are other small towns who offer uh, lecture series such as this, but most other small towns don't. So that's why we, we think we're doing something a little bit different here in providing these lectures with our, our mission, if you will, to be informed, entertained, and enlightened along the way, a combination of all. I think you will agree we will have achieved that uh, today. Uh, I want to acknowledge some people who helped make this happen. Uh, Chuck Everett has been a sponsor of the uh, lecture series. Also, uh, Brett Hosterman has done a terrific job this time helping with bookmarks and posters and the ads that you might have seen that show up in the Standard Journal and Daily Item. And some of you who have been through this before have been through, uh, showing up and helping us out here with the lecture series. You know, that we're not using orange and black this time around. We decided just to be bold and uh, <laughs> Gary and change it to green a little bit, maybe establish a little more of this identity moving away from the bicentennial. I'm not sure what color will be next year, who knows. But at any rate, uh, we use this to spread around town in the area to, to let you know uh, what we are doing here. Also, would like to thank uh, Amy Moyer, the publisher of the Standard Journal, uh, for donating valuable space in the Standard Journal to help us get the word out. And, and most especially a week ago or so, as we're moving into the bad weather last weekend, uh, we had to make some uh, tough decisions. Well, as it turned out, it wasn't that difficult, but the timing of it was. Uh, we pulled the trigger and it's too early, too late, and had to do it Thursday early enough. And I contacted Amy Moyer and said, you know, I'd like to get something else in there. And she said, fine, over. I didn't even have to ask. She said, fine, I'll put it on the front page, no charge. So we really appreciated that, and uh, that's what helps make, make this uh, a better activity for, for all of us. Um, and our speaker today has been most accommodating as well. As you well matter, we had him scheduled and locked in for uh, last Sunday, a week ago today. And of course, we got into the weather situation, and I, called, I had discussed this with him prior to that about the snow date. For some reason, I don't know how or why that happened, but at any rate, I asked him, I said, he said can you possibly reschedule it? He said, yes, and as soon as I saw that email, I just took a deep breath and said, okay, we got, we got this. This is, this is going to be okay. So, so we're very, very, very happy uh, about that. Um, and I also want to remind you as well that this is the first of three of these lectures. The next one, because of the postponement here, is two weeks from today. And then the third one in, uh, in April, uh, uh, sorry, in March, uh, just a month after that. Dr. Terry Madonna has a very extensive and impressive list of credentials. And uh, so I, just to save a, a, a bit of time and let him uh, uh, take the time this afternoon to talk to you about uh, politics, I uh, just highlight some of his uh, accomplishments and activities. He is a professor of public affairs and director for the Center of Politics and Public Affairs at Franklin Marshall College in Lancaster. He earned his doctoral degree of political history at the University of Delaware, which makes us fellow white and blue hands, by the way. Uh, and, and he has been teaching and writing about American, American presidency and political parties and voter behavior for more than 30 years. He co-writes bi-weekly bi -weekly political columns called Politically Uncorrected that runs in numerous state and national newspapers. He's conducted polls for newspapers throughout the state, including the Philadelphia Daily News, Harrisburg Patriot News, Pittsburgh Tribune, Review, and the Ready Eagle. 
and has also provided analysis for the New York Times, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Philadelphia Inquirer, Christian Science Monitor. He's a, obviously by now you know, a frequent go-to commentator slash analyst sharing his expertise with Pennsylvania newspapers and television stations. He's participated in seminars and has met with diplomats and journalists worldwide. When he has not been conducting polls and talking with the media, he's written several books and articles published in scholarly journals and popular outlets as well. He's been a Lancaster County Commissioner and he has served on several governmental boards, including former Governor Ed Edward Rendell's Higher Education Advisory Board and former Governor Dick Thornburg's Benjamin Franklin Partnership Board. In recognition of his many outstanding accomplishments, he was the recipient of a Distinguished Professor Award by the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the President's Medallion at Millersville University. And he was named Outstanding Speaker of the Year by the Speech Communication Society of Pennsylvania. So, please welcome Dr. Madonna to share with us his insights on Pennsylvania. seen anything until you've been in a college classroom at 8 o'clock. <laughs> I could never figure out if I was the last event of the night before, <laughs> the students are the first event of the day, but it was ugly. <laughs> before I get started on what I want to do, I want to make a, uh, you know, professors, we do pretty much what we want, that's why we have tenure. Uh, to make a long story short, as you know, there have been a lot of personal observations made by the folks in the social media about our politicians. I can't figure out what that colic is on President Trump's front of his hair that they keep talking about, or why he should care about what Melania Trump wears, but somehow that seems to be uh, very much in vogue, or Hillary Clinton's likability. We can go back to American history, by the way, and it's not uncommon to this day and age as you may recall, before the 1920s and 30s, most of the news in our country was disseminated by newspapers, which in fact were owned by political parties. So you basically read a party, you read a newspaper of your own party, and you would expect to find a lot of, not just political, but personal observations. I have a favorite I have to read to you. This one appeared in the Houston Telegraph in 1860. Now, the Houston Telegraph was no admirer of a guy named Abraham Lincoln. So this is what they wrote in their newspaper. So just when you think you've, you know, you've heard it or read it or seen it all today, imagine this. Lincoln is the leanest, lankest, most ungainly mass of legs, arms, and hatchet face ever strung upon a single frame. It gets worse. <laughs> he has the most unwarrantedly abused the privilege which all politicians have of being ugly. <laughs> and this, by the way, was one of the mildest comments <laughs> that appeared. So every time people will call me and they'll ask me about something that's, you know, you, look, you wonder what, why somebody actually said that about somebody. I can refer to a uh, whole uh, number of quotes that you know you can use from newspapers that basically party own. So let me say this: for the next 30 minutes, here's what you have to do. I've given you an assignment. You can't be a Democrat, you can't be a Republican, you can't be a conservative, and you can't be a liberal. That's not going to be easy. I know. Oh, and before I start, I have breaking news. There are only 646 days left in the 2020 presidential election. But who's counting? I'm certainly not counting. All right, before we get into uh, what I'm supposed to do, which is talk about contemporary politics, what's that guy's name? Oh, Tom Wolf. Yeah. Governor Wolf and Senator Casey and some other things that are going on. Let's take a little 
revisit of, of Pennsylvania history so we have a general sense about our politics. Throughout our entire history, once the political parties were born in the 1790s, Pennsylvania was pretty much committed to one party or the other. Before the Civil War, it was the Democratic Party. After the Civil War, I'm glad you're seated for this. From the 1860s until the 1950s, Pennsylvania was a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. Now, during the 1930s, when the New Deal was started and FDR instituted both the first and the second New Deal, the Democrats did win a governor, George Earl, they did win a Senate. And in the 1930s, you could begin to see some change. You know that city called Pittsburgh? You won't believe it, but it used to be Republican. And it began to evolve in the 1930s. But Philadelphia, perhaps the most democratic third class, third class, first class, we only have one first class city, city in our state, did not make the evolution to a democratic stronghold until the 1950s. And until that occurred, Pennsylvania was pretty much a Republican uh, state. So state, so uh, state. And this is important. Our general election for the United States presidency was, that, was taken for granted that it would go Republican. So <coughs> Republicans and Democrats didn't have to campaign here. They didn't have to vote for Pennsylvania for candidates for the presidency of the United States. Maybe after Buchanan, they thought that wasn't necessary anyway. And I live in Lancaster, by the way, and a member of the Lancaster County Historical Association, and also a written for them. So I have to be. Oh, I have to tell you a quick one. The Buchanan Society asked me if I would give one of the Buchanan lectures. I said sure. And then I added a caveat: You're not going to like what I have to say if I have to talk about his presidency which is now, by the way, evaluated by professional historians and political scientists as the worst president. When, you know, when you come below Harding and Grant, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> and I've fortunately been able to participate in, in many of them over the years. But I told the historical society that I am not going to talk about his presidency because I'm just not going to do that. So I, I said, I will talk about his political career and his rise through the ranks of a number of important positions, ultimately to become president. So at any rate, well, if we weren't important in that sense, because the electoral vote was in advance pretty much decided what was going on here. You know what was going on? Pennsylvania political leaders became kingmakers. What does that mean? That means if you think about people like Matthew Quay and Boyd Penrose, uh, Dimension 2, I could throw in Simon Cameron. These are the Republican political leaders that were the wheel and dealers. They decided who got not just the federal jobs, but the state jobs. And they were kingmakers in the sense that they would sit down with Republican leaders around the country and determine the Republican nominee for president and vice president. Remember this whole primary caucus system, you know, the modern feature. So the fact of the matter is that Pennsylvania Republicans, in a sense, were important not just because the state, and I'm not saying the state wasn't important, it was a big state, but its electoral vote was pretty well committed. And back through the year, I mean, imagine this. From 1880 to 1936, and I'll let you count up more than 50 years. The Republicans controlled the State Senate of the United States. I'm sorry, the State Senate of Pennsylvania without the interruption of a single election. I'm going to let that sink in. From 1886 to 1934, they controlled the House. So we're talking about literally one party controlling the state legislature for 50 plus years virtually unimaginable, I think, uh, today. So what happened was, in 1950, finally Pennsylvania began to evolve as a two-party state. And since the 1952 election, the Democrats have elected 
Pennsylvania has gone 10 times for president, for Democratic presidents, and seven times for Republican presidents, and those elections have been uh, pretty competitive, to say the least. So we went from being a non-competitive state to one of the most competitive states and one of the most visited states once we reached, you know, 1960. 1960 is another important, I have all these facts that I know are really over, you're going to take home and quote them at nausea. <laughs> but in 1960, for the first time in history, the Democrats gained the voter registration. 1960. But we then, throughout the following decade, we became a sought-after prize frequently visited by the, uh, by the presidential and vice presidential candidates. Something happened, however, in 1992, <coughs> in the election of Bill Clinton. What happened was the Democrats went on a, a, a victory spree, winning six straight presidential elections. So that in 2012, in 2012, it looked like our days as a pivotal state were over. It, the candidate Mitt Romney, where, where was he? Barack Obama, where was he? They didn't campaign in this state. And that's the first time since you know the 1950s when this evolution began towards a two-party two system. So basically what happened was that in 2016, 2016 I wish, uh, if you go if you go and you take a look at the Trump victory, carried our state, carried our state in the last presidential election by only 44,000 votes. You wanted another one, 0.07. And here's what happened. Hillary Clinton left this, virtually left the state alone. She campaigned occasionally in the state. But Trump and Pennsylvania played the <clears throat> critical role in the 2016 presidential election. Here's why. The Trump campaign developed essentially what is commonly known as a, the Rust Belt strategy. The Trump campaign went after working class voters in places out in the southwestern part of our state in particular, Beaver, Washington, Westmoreland, Fayette, Cambria, there are others out there. All of those counties, except Allegheny, in the southwest had voter, Democratic voter registration, and so does Allegheny, but there was one difference. All of them went for Donald Trump. The Rust Belt strategy was predicated on a couple of essential arguments, and here's what they were. Number one, the Democrats had walked away their roots among the working class voters. They had become the party of urban America. They left rural and small town America alone, particularly the working class voters. And so Trump developed a set of themes known as the Rust Belt Strategy. And those themes were that the trade deals like NAFTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership worked against the interest of working class voters who lived in the old mining and mill, mill towns whether it's bituminous coal out in that part of the state, up in our part of the state, in the Northeast, obviously, we're talking about anthracite coal, the old mills and the mines that produced all sorts of other aspects in the great industrial revolution. Trump in the campaign argued, Democrats walked away from it. So it's, what did Trump want to do? Get rid of, get rid of the tariffs, get rid of these old trade deals and start anew. And that strategy essentially is what carried him to the 44,000 vote victory. The turnout in those regions of the state went up sharply. Even though Hillary Clinton won Philadelphia and the four suburban counties, <clears throat> bottom line was Trump carried our state largely because of what he was able to do in the working class areas of our state out in the Southwest. He won Luzerne County, something unthinkable, what, 
a decade ago. He almost won, what's that county? Oh, Lackawanna County? Who would have imagined that? We only lost Lackawanna County by about 3,000 votes. And so he replicated that in Ohio, in Michigan, and in Wisconsin. Throw in Florida, and you've got his 304 electoral vote advantage over Hillary Clinton. So there's a bigger, a bigger message that I want to leave about the evolution in our political parties, and here's what it is. The Democrats have now become virtually the party of urban America. And what that translates, and I'm using these terms in a neutral, in a descriptive way, so when I talk about conservative and liberal, I'm using them descriptive. I'm not making a uh, political judgment about what they mean. So the Democrats, over the last decade and a half in particular, have become the party of urban America translation of a much more liberal constituency, immigrants, both legal and illegal, the minorities can add, add to that, and the people I hang around with, the 18 to 29-year-olds, <laughs> sometimes referred to as the millennials. But, and, and the Republicans have become the party of rural and small town America. And particularly if you go back to 2016, you see what I mean? Where I'm talking about a certain demographic, folks in certain occupations or whose ancestors were in those occupations. That meant that the, uh, that the Republicans were going to build a base there, which they have done. Then there's some other reasons for that. The folks who live in rural and small towns have a different uh, set of cultural interests. They tend to be more conservative on the great social issues over time, whether we're talking about abortion, uh, gay rights, you know, transgender issues. Uh, and one that's really important, it's called gun control, where they obviously fiercely oppose efforts to, as they would put it, to restrict or interfere with their Second Amendment rights. And so you have liberals versus conservatives in a stark fashion, cultural issues that they perceive very differently. And the battle in the United States right now is over the suburbs of our country. It's over the suburbs of our country. And for a good bit of modern Pennsylvania history, the suburbs were owned by the Republicans. I'm talking about Chester, Bucks, Montgomery, and Delaware counties in particular. And, and the suburbs of the, of the third class cities, once you get out of Harrisburg a bit, once you get out of Lebanon a bit, well, Lebanon's kind of an exception to it in other ways too. Once you get out of York City or Allentown, you get into the suburbs. Historically, just as the cities became democratic, you know, beginning in the 1930s up through the 1950s, the suburbs remained Republican. Now all that's changing. And in fact, if you go back and you look at the midterm election last year, the Democrats picked up 40 seats in the House of Representatives, 40. And the vast majority of them were in the suburbs all over our country. In our state, Democrats won the three suburban districts uh, in Phil outside of Philadelphia, in Bucks, Chester, and Montgomery, uh, and Delaware counties. Three in the fourth, fifth, and sixth congressional districts. They want to seat up in the seventh, but that's skip that for the moment. So you begin to see my point. The Democrats then picked up suburban seats. Moderate Republicans were literally chunked out of office. And so now, all across our country, even though the Democrats picked up, they got control of the House, they still, they don't have control of the United States Senate. Republicans picked up two seats to go to 53. But here's what's really important. The Republicans in offices all over the country are more conservative because the moderate Republicans were defeated by Democrats 
in a midterm election. You hanging in there with me on this? Let me go one step further. Let's talk about little old Pennsylvania. Let's take Congress. As the election unfolded, as we began the election last <coughs> November, well, let me back up. Beginning in, uh, beginning in 2012, because of the congressional map that was drawn by a Republican, the Republican state legislature and signed into law by the Republican governor, Tom Corbett, the Republicans won 13 of our 18 congressional seats. 13 of the 18, the Democrats five. 12, 14, a year, see where I'm heading with this. I, I, uh, there was a special election in 2018 in March out in Western PA, and the Democrats picked up a seat. A guy named Connor Lamb won that seat in the 18th Congressional District. So the Democrats went to seven, and the Republicans went to 12. But, but guess what happened? In the, in the Congressional elections last fall, as I indicated, the Democrats picked up three seats. The Republicans lost three. Bottom line, the delegation right now sitting in Washington, well, I guess they're home because the shutdown's over. Nine R's, nine D's. Nine R's, nine D's. You with me on that? Now, if we talk about little old Pennsylvania, the Republicans held on to both houses of the state legislature. But in the House of Representatives, they lost 11 seats, and they're now down. They're now down to 110. It takes 103, 102 votes to pass the law. But you know what happened? The 11 seats. They were mostly moderate Republican House members who lost the Democrats. Translation: The Republican House of Representatives is now one of the most conservative in Pennsylvania history. Because the conservatives, you know, are, they're smaller, but they're but proportionately there are more of them. And the same is true for the Senate, where the Republicans lost five seats. They went from 34 to 29. 26 is the majority there. And guess where they lost four of the five? The Philadelphia Burbs and up in the Lehigh Valley. What's that mean? So the Senate is more conservative. So as we sit here today, we have the most conservative legislature, I'll put it this way, in modern history, basically because the Republicans who are left are more conservative, and now they don't have to negotiate in their own caucus to work out some kind of deal. And we have a very, well, I have to be careful, I'm not allowed to say liberal anymore, progressive governor, liberals of majority. That's a, that's a joke. <laughs> it didn't get very far, did it? <laughs> uh, progressive governor and a very conservative legislature. So that's what the next couple of years look like as Governor Wolf begins his, his, his second term. So overall, a lot of, uh, another aspect, the Democrats in you'll read have this million plus voter registration edge in the state. But to be candid with you, Here's the way I put it. They have about an 800,000 active voter registration edge. Unless we do what California is likely to do and say everybody's registered. <laughs> we don't care what, whether you're a citizen or not. We don't care what you, how old everybody's going to be registered. You get the point. So the Democrats do have this edge. And here's the concern long term that maybe short term. <coughs> that the Republicans have, and here's what it is. As we sit here right now, all three of the so-called state row offices are held by Democrats. State Treasurer, Attorney General, Auditor General, all Democrats. Governor, a Democrat. And what Governor Wolf did four years ago in 2014 when he won his initial term, was to make another kind of history in our state. And here's what it is. Beginning in the 1950s, beginning in the 1950s, as our state became competitive, 
each political party got two terms, consecutive terms as governor. You got it? And then the other party took the governorship for two terms. That began, that began with the election of a guy named David Lawrence to the governorship, Allegheny County guy, and <coughs> followed by a guy named Leader from, what's that town? Oh, York, how could I forget York? By George, by George Leader. And then they was followed by Bill Scranton and by Ray Schaefer, his lieutenant governor. The next election was, of course, won in this pattern by what? A Democrat. It was Milton Schaap. And for the first time since before the Constitution was changed in the 1870s, Pennsylvania governors could have a second term. So Milton Schaap won in 70 and he won re-election in 74. That was the first time because they couldn't do it before. Every single governor from Milton Schaap up to Tom Corbin won the second term. And so Tom Wolf defeated Tom Corbin in 2014 and broke that two-term, you know, that consecutive two-term victory for the party in power. Uh, and Wolf now started it anew with his victory last year. We'll have to see if that goes anywhere. Can't be totally sure about that, whether, whether it will go anywhere or not. But you see the point. Now here's the problem the Republicans have long term. And by the way, when I had to talk about about Democrats having problems, I've done that too. I'm not being partisan about this. I have to live in the real world. So here's what it is. The Philadelphia suburbs, about a decade ago, the Democrats began to win elections in municipalities, ringing and bordering Philadelphia. In 2017, the Democrats won county-wide elections. You all know about them. You're going to go through that. These coming up, right? County road, offices, <coughs> municipal elections, township supervised. When you have borough council in here, do I got that right? This, I'm in a borough. Right? This is a borough. I know a little bit about it. <laughs> but you get the point. The Democrats did something they hadn't done historically. They won countywide elections in all four of Philadelphia counties. Plus, plus, the victories that I talked about that occurred with state house, state senators, and congressmen, and women. I ought to say congresswomen because all three Philadelphia suburban congressional districts elections were won by females. Oh, I, I, I have to mention it. I have to stop. Stop. See, I'm not using my notes, so I don't know where it is, whatever pops up in my head. And it's Sunday, for God's sake. <laughs> I have to have a little bit of a break. Here's what happened. Here, here, here's what happened. Throughout the entire history of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, we never elected more than two females at any time into our congressional delegation. Two. And we hadn't had one in the congressional delegation since 2014, when the only congresswoman at that point in our state was a woman named Allison Schwartz, who gave up her congressional seat to run in the Democratic primary for governor, losing to Governor Wolf. So in 2018, Pennsylvania elected four females. <clears throat> Into the governorship of the state, not into the governorship, in, into the congressional, in, into the congressional ranks. That's the most, the most the state has ever had. And I'm segueing into women because I want to talk about the changes that are taking place, particularly in the suburbs, but in all parts of our state that are pretty threatening to Republicans. And here's what they are. College-educated women are 60 to 65 percent more likely to be Democrats than Republicans. I'll let that sink in. And the reason, one of the reasons, the Democrats won the Philadelphia suburbs and the Republicans lost, and why Governor Wolf won re-election by 17 points, and by Senator Casey won re-election by 13 points was that 
college, white college educated female Republicans began to move away from the party and voted Democratic. Well, I want to let that sink in. And guess where a large number of college educated Republican women live? Someone take a guess? Suburbs. You got it. And so one of the problems that Republicans have is, quite frankly, a woman problem. I'll be very candid with you. The other problem they have happens to reside, again, with the people I hang around with, the so-called millennials. Actually, they're not the 18 to 29-year-old millennials are technically now 23, 24-year-olds. Uh, there's a generation called Generation Z. I mean, don't ask me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue what Generation Z does or means. <laughs> but you get the point. Millennials over what are, are 60 to 65% also more likely to be Democrats. And I want to stop for a minute and talk about this because this is something that's going to play out into our future. And here, here, here's the way to think about this. I'm glad you see it. There are 80 million of them, 18 to 34 year olds. In 10 years, they're going to run the country, politically, governmentally, and, and perhaps even economically. They're going to own us. They are culturally very liberal. Got it? Culturally very liberal. That's point number one. Point number two, of all the age demographics, whether we're talking about Gen Z, Gen X, baby boomers, you can go to the silent generation, that's many of us here. <coughs> Guess what? They gave Hillary Clinton a larger percentage of their vote than any other age group. And they also <coughs> live in the cities. They love city life, by the way. They don't like rural life, sorry. I live in Lancaster County, so I can say that. But you get the point. And they have a whole different set of views. I have a whole lecture on them. I'm not going to stop and give it to you now, but I'll put it this way. They're different than we are. <laughs> I'm not saying that in any mean spirited way. I love them. I hang around with them. That's what I do. But they are very, very different. So here's the problem Republicans have long term. If you don't, if you lose disproportionately the female vote, and you lose the millennial vote, what's left? And the increase in the minority population vote, which is more Democratic than Republicans. Now Hispanics do, uh, Republicans do have some opportunities with Hispanics, but. The Republicans are going to have to go back to the drawing board and figure out exactly what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. Because long term, a state like Pennsylvania, which has historically been viewed as, well, since the 50s as competitive, we could end up going back to one party status. I'm not predicting that. And I know Trump won by 44,000 votes, blah, 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 but I'm looking at long term. Uh, given that Wolf was able to beat Corbett by 10 points, given the fact that Casey and Wolf both won handily, given the fact that all three row office holders are Democratic, given the fact that the Democrats, yes, they still don't have control of the state legislature, but they've improved the, their numbers considerably. So I'm merely looking ahead at what we're seeing both in demographic as well as political terms. All right, let's go to, a complete, let's now come up to date and talk a little bit about modern, about modern uh, uh, the situation right now in Pennsylvania. Governor Wolf is in his second and final term, so he can't seek re-election. In many respects, he was a very unusual candidate to begin with. And I don't want to see that blue Jeep anymore, which was the subject of 8,000 persons. <coughs> By the way, there was a brilliant introductory commercial. It took a guy who wasn't known and introduced him in a way that wasn't offensive. It's was actually kind of cute. People liked it. But he also had it. Uh, Corbett, his predecessor, was elected in 2010 in the Tea Party election. That was the election in which the Republicans took over the federal house 
took over the state house in Pennsylvania, largely because of the unpopularity then of, of President Obama, largely because of the Great Recession and the fiscal difficulties that Governor Corbett had in terms of handling the state budget, blah, 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 was shut down and through all of that. And so it was pretty unusual for a guy like Wolf, who had never held a public office before, uh, I'll qualify that, elected public office. And now, in, in some respects, not totally rare, in, in our state, a guy named Milton Schaap owned a cable company down in Montgomery County and got elected. Uh, he was a businessman. He never held an elective office, but he was very, very active in the Democratic Party. Uh, I'm talking about um, Milton, Milton Schaap. Uh, he was elected largely because of some problems that existed in the 1960s. I'm not going to get into all of that. And Schaap served his two terms. Uh, Bottom line here is Governor Wolf takes office at a very interesting time in our state. And I'll talk a little bit in a moment about what, he, what he's likely to do and first of all, what he did. But here's what's fascinating. Second term for Pennsylvania governors, as we say in Lancaster County, ain't good. Uh, Milton Schaap decided he was going to run for the presidency of the United States. Now imagine that. He had a he got out of the race when he ran behind no preference in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> not, not the best thing, right? If you want to run, you run behind no preference. Uh, Governor Thornburg barely won re-election in 1982, and it didn't exactly have the best second term in terms of getting what you want. Here's one of the reasons. Here we are in 2019. We have the presidential election coming up next year. Guess what's going to happen in November of 2020? The gubernatorial election will start because Wolf can't <coughs> succeed himself. See where that all goes? So we're going to have, and then nothing will happen. And so that's typically a problem. Senator Governor Casey, uh, Senator Casey's dad, had a very serious health problem, amyloidosis. He had a double organ transplant in his second term, and we all know what, you know, that wasn't particularly good. Tom Ridge never even stayed. He was by far the most popular governor in modern Pennsylvania history. His job performance exceeded, or was around 60% in the poll that we did at Norrisville University when I was uh, conducting the poll there. 60%, he went on to be Homeland Security, uh, first Homeland Security Director. And Ed Dell handily won a second term, but it wasn't much of a second term. So, you know, there's nothing notable or whatever happens in these second terms. So Governor Wolf has about two years, but he's also facing, as I just pointed out, the most conservative Republican legislature in modern history. So we can see where his agenda is going to go far, right? We know that's going to be a stunning success. He has the budget message on February 5. We'll see where, where, where that all goes. So I'm trying to make the bigger point here that the Democrats, I think, are much more likely to succeed in our state because of the demographics I've talked about. And unless and until the Republicans try to figure it out with even a more conservative majority, what's likely to happen in our state. So you all, you all good with this? So let's talk about what's, what, what's imminent. Governor Wolf won re-election by 17 points. The man who ran against him, a guy named Scott Wagner, a state senator, was the best can, was the best candidate in Pennsylvania history. Uh, to put it another way, he was perhaps one of the worst. And so Governor Wolf also had the advantage. What was the advantage? Here's what it was. It was a great year for Democrats. I just pointed that out, right? They took over the, con the lower house in Congress. They picked up seats in the legislature. They picked up seats in the in the, uh, in the congressional delegate. I mean, there wasn't anything that the Republicans could sit back and say, "Gee, we had a great year." And so, as as we talk about this, Governor Wolf, despite 
some obvious difficulties in his first term. You know what he did? He had three budgets that were not passed on time. One of them went a whole year. But you know what the difference was and why the voters didn't care? Not a single state worker was laid off. Not a single state program was put on hold or curtailed. The state functioned, the state functioned, even though the new budget had not been adopted. Unlike what happened during the Corbett years, and unlike what happened with the shutdown, where programs, right, federal services were, were cut off and where they were beginning to have a pretty big effect after, what, 35 days. But in our state, during Tom Wolf's governorship, none of that occurred. And if I learned anything, the voters in our state aren't overwhelmingly paying attention to what goes on in the Capitol. As long as they're not being damaged or hurt or in some way disadvantaged by it, they can comfortably go through their life without worrying too much about it. So the schools were open, you know, the kids were getting their education, and the checks were being delivered for the people who get a variety of state, you know, resources. That was all being done. In addition to that, Governor Wolf had enough of a of a degree, a fair degree of success during his first term. Uh, perhaps the most popular item that he got approved was uh, medical marijuana. We're uh, one of 23 states that now have medicinal marijuana. I want to talk about recreational marijuana in a minute. But having said that, they also did a whole variety of uh, schools in one over his four years had a 17% increase in their budgets. That was perhaps his biggest priority. I could sit here, or stand here, you're sitting, and go through a whole variety of the programs that, you know, some of his successes, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I want to, I want to we'll run out of time if I do that. The point that I'm trying to make is that it was a reasonably successful first term. He also benefited by the uplift in the economy. Right, which meant that the state's revenues, the last budget, the one right now, the Republicans and the Democrats, Republicans controlled the legislature, they approved the budget in June. It, did, it wasn't late, and it called for almost a 3% increase in spending, $33 billion. Think about that for a minute. Education benefited again. Republicans agreed to it because it was an election year and they wanted, as we say, out of Dodge to go back and campaign. Now, one of the things that Republicans tried to use on Governor Corbett, Governor Corbett, Governor Wolf, that didn't work, was in his first two budgets, he called for an increase in sales and income taxes. You know why the voters didn't care? Because they didn't do it. <laughs> He called for them, but they, you know, their paychecks were not affected when they bought something, you know, at a store. They weren't paying, they were only paying the 6% so sales to get it. But he did call for a tax that was very popular with the voters. I pre pulled on it. Seven's tax. Not a cubic feet, tax on the cubic feet extracted from the frack wells. He also supported the, the uh, cracker plant out in Beaver, Beaver County. He also, with you know, some concern about the environmental aspects, but he's not opposed to the pipelines that move the uh, natural gas out of our state into other states and eventually all over the world. So, and some Democrats, by the way, don't like that for obvious reasons that they would state. So the bottom line is that he had a reasonably successful governorship in a time when the economy was good and what he proposed that was unpopular, they didn't do. <laughs> and the severance tax, by the way, is very popular with the voters. Very, very popular with the voters. So overall, I think most of us who follow what goes on in Harrisburg pretty carefully think the governor's going to have a tough time with any agenda that tries to move too quickly to the left. But I want to say something about one of the things that <coughs> The legislature is not going to do, but it's going to be a hot issue. And here's what it is. It's recreational, the legalization of recreational marijuana. 
let me start with this. Ten states now have recreational marijuana. It's regulated and it's taxable. Number two, New Jersey and New York are in a battle to see who becomes first in the states that will you know, order us to do that. Both are likely to do it. Governor Cuomo in New York has said he wants that to be in his first 100 days. We'll see whether that takes place or not. So in the polls that I've done, we've done at Franklin and Marshall and others, 59% of Pennsylvania voters support recreational pot. Do I have to tell you by age group? <laughs> I'm trying to avoid, hold on, I'm trying to avoid getting into detail, but I, I, I will, if I can find this, I, I got it right here. First of all, feel like this. Voters under 35, 81% support it. <laughs> Voters who live in Philadelphia, 80% of them support it. Democrats, 66% support it. Only 42% of Republicans. By, by ideological category, 83%, 83% of liberals. But 46% of conservatives. It's not, you know, down 20 or 30%. Uh, 83 83 percent of liberals and here's one that confuses me but I think I have an understanding of this I, I, I can't imagine this but this is what it says 71 percent of voters over 75 support it <laughs> I understand why I think the words <laughs> saying the time had not come, the time had not come. 
after he was elected, he said, and I'll use his words, a serious, serious, that's his word, honest, that's his word, look, meaning he probably is leaning towards it, but he's not given the fact that it has zero chance over the next two years to pass the Pennsylvania legislature. Remember, I'm back to that argument I made about conservative, conservative, conservative. So he's way too, the legislature's way too conservative to do it. Uh, uh, Senator Corman, not too far from here, over in Center County, has said, given all the reasons why he's opposed to it, the new majority leader in the House didn't even vote for, for the legalization of medical marijuana. So it's not going to go anywhere. But it's going to be a big issue, and it's going to be hotly debated in the state for the next couple of years. So I thought I would, would, would go with that. So uh, I want to do one. I have no clue how long I talk. I don't care. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just having fun. Let's, uh, let me say something about Senator Casey. Senator Casey, of course, dad was governor of the state for two terms. Uh, Senator Casey, as a young man, 24, 25, 26, got involved in his dad's campaign, very knowledgeable about the political history of the state. He was elected twice as Auditor General, once as State Treasurer, then got elected <coughs> to the United States Senate by beating Rick Santorum. He has now won, as he did it happened last November, he has now won three terms as our United States Senator. Of course, we have a Republican, Pat Toomey, who holds the other seat. <coughs> Toomey was reelected in 2016. So he'll be in that office, but he's in his second, you know, second year. Bottom line, let's talk about Senator Casey. One of the reasons that Senator Casey won is that unlike, he's from Scranton, so you can't call anybody from Scranton urban. It doesn't make it. It's pretty much a working class town. But here's what's really fascinating about Senator Casey. Senator Casey has emerged out of the 47 Democrats in the Senate as one of the toughest critics of President Trump. Got that? But there's an exception. Senator Casey agreed with President Trump about NAFTA and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, about using tariffs if necessary on countries that discriminate against American industrial products like steel and others. He agreed with the president about ratcheting up the sanctions dealing with countries that they would both argue engage in fair, in fair trade, which is very, very different than most Democrats. In addition to that, Senator Casey has maintained close relationships with groups and individuals in working class families, not just up in his neck of the woods in the Northeast, but also out in the Southwest, which makes him very different from somebody like Hillary Clinton, even though he endorsed Clinton, you know what I mean, he supported her and all of that. Now, he also has another couple of things. He's pro-life, personally, but he supports Planned Parenthood, but he did support in Congress, he opposed extending the time that you could get an abortion 20 weeks to 24. And on guns, he's also shifted his position a bit, as his party has, until assault weapons, uh, bump stocks, uh, un ex expanding universal background checks. So he has you know, moved to the left as his party has moved to the left. And so there was this brief period of time where Casey in fact, we wrote a column about it, considered running for the presidency. You'd have to get in a long line of about 30 people. And so when we, after we wrote the column, some folks got back and said, well, the Democrats would never nominate a pro-lifer, regardless of what, what they've done, you know, in terms of plan for, you know, you get it. That, that just wouldn't happen. And then I stupidly thought that he might make a decent VP candidate because he does appeal to those voters got it, the working class voters in the states that the Democrats need to do better in the presidency uh, in 2020. So overall, 
it, and then Casey withdrew. So I don't think it rules out the fact that he could be considered VP. Tom Ridge, by the way, was on the short list not once but twice of people for uh, for the, uh, for the, uh, uh, as a vice presidential selection. And uh, I, I would doubt. Then people said, well, why didn't you mention Governor Wolf as a possible VP selection by the Democrats? If you're going to pick someone and you're a progressive woman candidate for the presidency, why would you pick the governor when you have Senator Casey who has a much broader, you know, wider appeal as a U.S. Senator, blah, blah, blah. So overall, in conclusion, and then we'll do whatever. How long did I talk? Does anybody know? I've talked an hour? I don't pay attention. At any rate, I think we're in for some very exciting political times in the next couple of years. I think probably less is going to get done in Congress and less is going to get done in Harrisburg than what we normally would expect. Some of that second term, I guess some of it is just the nature of these deep divisions. And let me conclude. I wasn't going to do this, but my wife's throwing coffee all over my nose. <laughs> I'm still talking. I'm still talking. <laughs> Racial discrimination is the main reason blacks can't get ahead. 64% of Democrats said yes, 14% of Republicans. Immigration strengthens our country because immigrants bring hard work and talent. 84% of Democrats said yes, 42% of Republicans said yes. Government is always wasteful and inefficient. 45% of Democrats said yes. 70% of Republicans. <clears throat> Immigrants burden the nation, taking our jobs, our health care, and our housing. Only 12% of Democrats agreed to that, 44% of Republicans. Here's a good one. Stricter environmental laws and regulations <coughs> cost jobs and hurt the economy. Only 20% of Democrats agreed to that, 8%. <coughs> of Republicans did. The average gap on these things that we call political values is 37 points. You want to know why Democrats and Republicans have trouble agreeing and why we go through this? Here's something else that's pretty important. For the first time since we had scientific polling, a majority of Democrats now call themselves liberal. 73% of Republicans call themselves conservative, and that's not a big change. So we are deeply polarized in ways that appear almost unfixable. In other words, how do you fix something like this that, and so now when these issues come up and people act the way they do, it's perfectly understandable. If I'm a Democrat, I represent constituencies that have very different views from the constituents of Republicans. We not only represent different geographies in many cases, but we represent different ideological formats and bases that create this huge deep divisions in our country. Now, you know, someday we'll get out of this, uh, but it's not going to be fun. I'm bringing you great news, aren't I? It's not going to be a lot of fun, I think, given this deep polarization. And we'll see it in this shutdown. I'm glad I didn't have to talk about that in the shutdown now that it's over and whether President Trump and the Democrats can work out some deal on border security, which all seems to this observer just irrational that they can't work this out uh, somehow, some way. But for, for Nancy Pelosi, who said not a dollar for the wall, 
guess what? Her base now, now, her base of support in the Democratic caucus in the House has been replenished with a host of progressives, 40 new members, a host of progressives. So she's in reflecting the will of her caucus. She's not doing anything. Now, there are Democrats who come out of the woodwork now and said, we can work this out and do it. And so this is the kind of polarization that exists, and it's not likely to go away anytime soon. All right, I'm done. <laughs>
free college education, <laughs> which you're going to pay for, by the way. <laughs> but, and I, I'm only just started on that agenda. So you can see the point here. The Democrats are going to have that battle, and we still don't know exactly what's going to transpire within that battle and how that works out. The other thing is some experts I've talked to, I'm not among them, who think that Trump may not run. That he might not run. And he could face a nomination battle. I doubt it. But you've got three or four possibilities led by now the former governor of Ohio, who's been sharply critical of him, and some U.S. senators, one or two of whom, you know, didn't run for re-election. So you can't rule out, you can't rule out that he'd have a nomination challenge. I don't think so, but you can't rule that out. All right, I'm going to keep my answer short so we can get out of here. I'm going to go over here and go across. You know who used to do that? Start here and go like that. You didn't have your hand up, you didn't get it. Marla. Right that game. You didn't have your hand up. No, you don't have to do that. I'm going <laughs> my, my main uh, concerns are, and if you would address the structural uh, elements of voter participation, uh, democracy in, in Pennsylvania, gerrymandering, um, voter registration. You know, Pennsylvania is still, we have to, you know, people have to register a month before the election. Yes. Open <clears throat> primaries, the role of independents. And really, that affects uh, voter participation. Uh, getting on board with, you know, getting away from that Tuesday and, and maybe a day off, and voters, we get more participation. Yeah, I don't think you're going to see much change because of how the Republican control of the legislature, but other states are moving there to same day registration. They're doing more with uh, how uh, ab uh, no, no reason, no cause, absentee ballots, you can just get one, you don't have to make up a reason, which right. I suspect a lot of people do. But yeah, you're on you're on to something, whether we make it easy or not. In fact, California is considering a couple of things that, you know, everybody's going to get a mail ballot. And they're not too sure whether you gotta be a citizen or not. We're going to go we're going to end up there in some of these states like New York or California before it's finished. Now we're pretty far at the opposite side where we obviously need to make it easier you know what I mean, to do it, but I don't see much in the way of change because of, I, I just don't think the Republicans that control the legislature are going to do any wholesale modifications of our uh, of our uh, electoral system. Well, so on gerrymandering, we, we will have to do something. Well, yeah. But that, the Jerry, here, yeah, this is the whole lecture in itself. Let's talk about this. Congressional seats in Pennsylvania are redrawn every 10 years after the census by the state legislature in the, in the form of a law, which the governor can sign or veto, or that become law without a signature. Governor Corbett signed it in 2011. There's no doubt that that favored the Republicans. You got it. There's no doubt that that benefited the Republicans. They emerged 13 to 5. Before that, 2011, Democrats had an advantage of about one or two seats. All right, you with me on this? Now, there are efforts being made to change, to get, to get the legislature out of that. The bill's been introduced to have an independent commission do it. Uh, what happened is the Supreme Court, in uh, March of last year, decided that the boundary lines that, that were drawn in 2011 were unconstitutional, and they redrew the boundary lines. And it was peeled, I won't get into all that. And that's why the Democrats were able to pick up the seats they did. So we don't know what's going to happen in 2021 after the 2020 census. Right now, the state legislature will do it, just as it's done in the form of a law. Who knows? It could get challenged again. Well, Governor Wolf probably wouldn't sign it to begin with if, if it moves too far from where it exists now. State lawmakers, on the other hand, their, their redistricting is done by a five-person reapportionment commission. That's in the state constitution. Two Democratic leaders, two Republican leaders, and if they can't agree on the fifth, the Supreme Court appoints it. And typically, that's about incumbent protection. They've actually agreed only because their biggest job has been to protect certain incumbents. So I don't know where that would go. That's not, that uh, wasn't even challenged uh, in court. So well, we don't know, but you know, it's, it's going to be a huge issue as it plays out in the state. Go ahead. 
Uh, I was wondering this on uh, Jerry Mandarin. Do you see any procedure that would uh, uh, appear to be uh, fair to uh, both liberals and Yeah, the question, the question, yeah, I mean, the one thing that people have recommended who are independent of our parties and, you know, don't participate in it is a, some kind of a independent commission consisting of a variety of folks who don't have a vested interest in it from good government groups like the League of Women Voters and others, but you would still put some party people on it. But the question is, what happens when they get done? Is their work just final? You got it? They just produce it and it's over? Does it have to go back to the legislature? Does it have to go to the voters? I don't know. Uh, other states have done that. Uh, but, you know, many states still have some form of gerrymandering that goes on. I don't know that you completely draw, completely draw boundary lines that are going to satisfy people in both parties. That's not going to happen. Go ahead. I believe you said that the Republicans had an opportunity with Bob, uh, Latino Republicans had an opportunity. Yeah, I think, well, first of all, the Hispanic uh, voters are not, uh, they're culturally more conservative. Let's start with that. As a whole, not all of them. And, when the elections are held, they're not as solidly behind the Democrats as, as African Americans are. And so that's one group that they might be able to find appeals that they could make, depending on you know the state. In our state, I think the Latinos are something like eight or nine percent of the population. We don't have the same numbers as North Carolina or California or New York as, as, other, as other states do. And our African-American population is about 12 or 13 percent. So I just think they might have it. I don't know how you can move forward in our society without having appeals that you can't lose the women vote, you can't lose the minority vote by those percentages, you got it? And when, how do you win statewide elections? Anybody want to help me out? Jerry. Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> I said statewide. I said statewide. Anybody else over on this side? Yes, sir. Do you have any insight on why Marino would have uh, resigned two weeks into his uh, term? To spend more time with his family? That's the usual reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's what's going on. We're going to have, uh, I think it's five special elections, a couple of lawmakers and state lawmakers. I think part of it is the fact that these men and women are going to their respective capitals, Harrisburg or D.C., and nothing happens. It's bitter. It's not fun. It's nasty. Uh, and the lawmakers themselves don't, don't get along. I, 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 back in the day, when I was on the Norridgeville faculty, I lobbied for public higher education. I spent a good bit of time in, in Harrisburg. And here's the biggest change from 30 or 40 years ago. Lawmakers today don't like each other party to party, got it? And they don't trust each other. Now how do you work with someone that you don't like and you don't trust? And then you have these huge differences with your own electorate that I talked about earlier. It's a perfect recipe, uh, you know, I, I don't have a clue. I don't have a, I mean, and many times the reasons they give aren't the reasons. It has to do with other things. Uh, and you know, it's not like in this district, which is heavily Republican, that he had to worry about getting elected. I don't know that I'd want to do constituent service in 15 counties that runs, you know, bigger than 50 states that I could mention. Go ahead. Does there anything have to be done to change? Now, this is on the national level. Uh, the Citizens United number. No, I don't think so. Not at the moment. Only by the court. Yeah, I, I, yeah. The limits on uh, funding uh, public, it's, it's a tough one. And you know, if you're wealthy, the courts already said, you can spend your own money. Well, I mean, we've had governors, you know, like Tom Wolf, who self-funded their campaign. And Scott Wagner put a good bit of money ultimately in, 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 into his campaign. Probably nothing that can be done about that in the short run. Go ahead. Why is it Pennsylvania has term limits on the governorship, but not on state legislators? Because legislators get to do that. <laughs> 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 they're not about to, uh, yeah. yeah. They're going to act in their own self-interest, and uh, they're not like, you know, the job pays pretty well, and here's what you get. 
you get a nice pension, and even more important, well, no, not more important, but you get health care for life. I'm going to let that sink in. <laughs> health care for life. And we had a lawmaker who just got charged with sexual assault, and he stayed in. They didn't force him out until he got, made sure he got his pension and made sure he got his health care. Am I getting cynical? <laughs> Go ahead. Would you see economically that progressing ideas of health care for everybody, free health care for everybody, free education, uh, free this, free that, would have a ruinous effect economically? Would that then switch the, the political uh, picture? Well, you know what's happened in European countries that have had it? No, it's not affected it because the people still remain committed to it. And I'm not sure yet that, remember, the Republicans control the Senate. So the progressive agenda, even if it comes out of the House, isn't going to you, you get it. Or even if uh, if the Republicans still control the Senate, and even if the Democrats win the presidency, I mean, I think there's ways to do some of what they want in terms of expanding health care. You know, I mean, there are things that can be done that would be widely accepted by the American people. And the economic, I mean, Critics of it simply call it a socialist agenda, and you're going to hear that that word is going to be bandied about um, pretty uh, pretty frequently, I think, in the next uh, couple of years. Go ahead. For a long, long time, the tea area of Pennsylvania has been the voting Yes. Actually, that still remains, except for the cities that are in the tea, as I said, in the suburbs. I don't see that much changing. I don't, I, the real change, again, is out in the out the southwest and up in the northeast with Democratic voters who are voting Republican, and down in the Philly burbs where you have Republican voters who are voting Democratic. You follow that? I'm not saying here and there there might be some shifts. I mean, I guess State College who's here lives in State College. I mean, we know that how State College is going to vote, right? There's no doubt because of the influence of the university. We, that, but I don't see much difference. The problem that Republicans have is that those parts of the state have the <coughs> smallest population. You got it. They're not the places that, oh, here's the big news. The, when you take a look at the out migration, it's, it's the millennials who are leaving. The millennials are leaving our state in larger numbers than any other age cohort. Now, many of them go to college and don't come back. Or many of them, if they have the ability and they work here and have opportunities to go elsewhere, do so. And the one thing I have found out, and you live in a small town, is that young people don't want to live in rural and small town America. They like urban life. They love urban life. And I think these trends are going to play themselves out. Again, I have a whole lecture on it. Now, but it's going to be pretty big. Anybody in here? Okay, we'll do one more and then I'm getting out of here. You're including uh, socialist and progressive? Well, some of that. I mean, that's what the critics call it. I'm not calling I'm just saying the critics are going to call it socialism. And you're going to hear an awful lot about it. And the other thing you're going to hear a lot about from Republicans is what's happened to other countries that have, that, that, yeah, that have utilized that agenda. You're going to hear an awful lot from Republicans about that. Question two, uh, Wolf Administration and Living Wage. So, oh, you raised a great point. Something I should have talked about, but didn't. Right now, our minimum wage is the national minimum wage, which is $7.25 an hour. It's been that way since 2009. 20 states since then have raised the minimum wage. Governor Wolf is now calling to raise the minimum wage to twelve dollars an hour, and then ultimately to fifteen bucks an hour. I can't see. Again, we're back to the conservative. Right. Now, it wouldn't. Do I think it's completely out of the question? Maybe they compromise and go to ten bucks an hour. You get my point? No, I, I don't understand if they would go. I don't see fifteen like California. No, no. But no. twelve, I think, is a little high. Also, yeah, but they also could go somewhere. You know. 725, 
I'm only saying in, ter in terms of the history. Now, if it's been that way since 2009 and they've done nothing with it, then where does that pay? So I'm, I, I, I would be shocked if they did uh, 12 bucks, but maybe something else. Did you say and it'll happen. I'm sorry. Did you say compromise? Excuse me. Yeah. Compromise. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, let me just say this. Thank you for coming, and I want to say, make another point, and I'm glad you're active in your historical society. I think this is very important as a political, as a historian by training. I think it's really important that we all write about, talk about, and maintain our local history, which if we don't do it, will be lost and obscured, and people like me will come along and make something up. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing is, keep a sense of humor, I try. But anyway, <laughs> Thank you.